Okay. Yes. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the 11th webinar in our series on the economics of coronavirus, organized by the Economics Department at SOAS and the Open Economics Forum. Um, the Open Economics Forum is a student society at SOAS that promotes heterodoxy, decolonization, and democratization in economics. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everybody involved in organizing today's webinar and the series as a whole, both at SOAS and in the OEF. I know everyone's put a lot of hard work in behind the scenes. Um, my name is Oliver Tipton, and I'm a master's student at SOAS. Um, and today's talk will be given by Arania Dimoko, a lecturer in economics at SOAS on the topic of healthcare crises in Greece. Um, and I'm sure the topics covered will be relevant. Sir, and the Sorry about that. Um, yeah, and I'm sure the topics covered will be relevant to the healthcare systems uh, around the world. Um, Rania, next 25 to 30 minutes. And then we will have time for the quest time for questions um, for the rest of the session. Please write your questions in the chat box as we go along and after the talk, and we'll try to get through all of them. Um, and before I begin, I just want to mention that you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, where you'll find information about our previous and upcoming webinars, and can join in the conversation there using the hashtag economics of COVID. I'll put the details in the chat box in a second. Um, yeah, and over to you, Arani. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation uh, to take part in this amazing uh, series of uh, COVID-related webinars. Um, thanks very much to the OEF, of course, for uh, initiating this, um, uh, this idea. And um, of course, a great thanks would go to all the people behind the organization of this of this amazing series uh, not least to the OEF uh, students in particular uh, Marie, Anna, Alice, uh, Daniela and Oliver that is the moderator today uh, but also to the um, economics colleagues um, Sara and Yanis that have been uh, helping out with the organization as well and um, yes uh, I'm going to as some of the uh, presenters in the previous uh, webinars, I'm going to defy um, the guidelines of uh, the no use of slides. And I'm going to put on some slides that I think are going to help us uh, <clears throat> to visualize some of the points I would like to be making. And I'm going to be sharing them now, if that's OK. <clears throat> uh, and OK, sorry, one second. Yes, okay, I hope you can all see them. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about um, COVID and healthcare uh, and the particularly the healthcare um, conditions and crisis, if you will, uh, in Greece. And I'm going to touch a little bit on the EU, but that will also only be uh, towards, uh, towards the end. Um, I'm going to be approaching the topic of COVID and the healthcare crisis within the Greek context from uh, the point, from the starting point of um, of Greece being portrayed as a um, success story when it comes to the uh, containment of the of the pandemic. Uh, but then uh, the point will be to trace out the the reasons. Uh, for that success, if you will, uh, story or how successful uh, it has indeed uh, been. Um, so it will be scrutinized, particularly in relation to the initial conditions of the healthcare system at the onset of the pandemic, uh, which will necessarily uh, be linked to the uh, 10 years of austerity, of austere, severe austere measures that uh, preceded the COVID um, crisis. And it would be through this lens that we will then re-examine uh, what is meant by um, the um, Greek success story when it comes to uh, COVID. But before we start, on these things, uh, okay, bringing in the bigger picture, we all know it, but it's good to um, keep uh, reminding ourselves, um, yes, this is a global crisis with um, unprecedented in terms of life loss, um, in terms of reaching all the 
territories um, of the globe in terms of livelihood laws, in terms of uncertainty uh, for future prospects uh, with the economic crisis uh, underway, particularly because of some of the uh, containment uh, measures that uh, the um, pandemic um, necessitated, as well as alarming um, rise in unemployment uh, at the global uh, level. Um, so yes, I mean, COVID is a uh, first and foremost a health crisis, but uh, also a global economic crisis, um, a global shock, if you will, hitting from both. Um, the demand and the supply side um, and uh, with unequal impacts and uh, responses throughout the globe, but yet unprecedented uh, policy measures being uh, put um, uh, down on the monetary, the fiscal side in terms of um, income uh, replacement, particularly due to lockdowns uh, and so on. And it is within this global pandemic unprecedented context that um, Greece has been portrayed uh, in international um, media as a unexpected um, success uh, story. Um, it has been picked up by pretty much all the major um, um, journals around uh, the globe. Uh, and in some cases, it has also been um, explained as um, as the previous crisis helping uh, the COVID uh, containment. Um, now, this is the starting point, and this is what uh, this in this talk I would like for us to to scrutinize and have a look at. Um, is this indeed a success story, and what has necessitated? Yes. So yes, the Greek success story when it comes to the containment dispersion of COVID-19 and uh, the low death uh, rate in Greece, which is still, I mean, this is all ongoing, so at the moment is still actually very low. It's one of the lowest within um, uh, the EU with only 15.9 um, uh, deaths per million of population. Um, so yes, this containment has been primarily the outcome of the very early and uh, very strict lockdown measures that were imposed by the government and followed by the citizens since um, the 12th or so of uh, March. Um, and um, again, what we will be doing is a look at what, what were the conditions, if you will, then necessitated this very strict and very early um, lockdown. And in so doing, I think um, it's important um, to from the onset differentiate between the relate look at the relationship between um, response to COVID and uh, the uh, capacity of uh, of the system as a whole. Um, now capacity understood in very broad terms and I put down three dimensions are interconnected but still important to be differentiated and highlighted. So we have healthcare capacity so essentially uh, and Again, because of COVID, for example, there is a need for expansion of that capacity uh, uh, on the healthcare front when it comes to preventive diagnostic and inpatient care. So testing, for instance, for COVID or testing for antibodies as well as inpatient um, ICU beds and all that, which is interlinked, of course, with fiscal capacity and fiscal space, meaning financial capacity, what capacity is there to finance uh, these necessary expansion uh, of the healthcare capacity, as well as, which is usually um, uh, for state capacity and capability broadly understood as the capacity of the state for uh, welfare uh, provision broadly and healthcare here in. Um, uh, and with that uh, state um, capacity, uh, we are going to be focusing uh, on the uh, public-private nexus in the process of um, of the of provision of, of um, welfare and social provision broadly understood. Uh, now, this uh, capacity, which is very important with all its dimensions uh, to respond to COVID, is um, 
can be um, better uh, understood as, of course, a historically embedded uh, process uh, within, again, context uh, specific, country specific um, uh, policy making cultures and norms. And, of course, it can be um, understood within, um, um, if you will, a system of provision approach following um, uh, Ben Fine's um, um, analysis uh, by uh, essentially. Um, analyzing the uh, different uh, and the interactions and reconfigurations of the different agents that are taking part in the whole process of, uh, of, of, of social or infrastructural provision from the beginning, from the production until, until the end uh, use. So these will essentially all be determining uh, the broadly understood uh, capacity to respond uh, to, a, to a crisis okay, to, or to an emergency. Okay. So to do that for uh, the Greek story, I'm going to start with a very, very brief um, background of the Greek healthcare system. Uh, it was constituted, the national healthcare system was constituted in 1983, uh, so quite late in relation to North uh, Europe and at a time where actually welfare systems in continental Europe were being uh, attacked, the demise of Keynesianism, the advancement of neoliberalism, uh, and um, private or shadow banking finance. Uh, that was the time where uh, the Greek national healthcare system was constituted. It currently consists of um, 125 public hospitals that cover about 65% of capacity, the rest is private. Uh, when it comes to this is inpatient care, when it comes to public, uh, to primary uh, care, um, uh, on the public sphere, it's quite lacking, and the space is uh, occupied predominantly again by uh, private medical practices. There are about uh, 20,000, 22,000 uh, private medical practices in Greece, as well as private diagnostic centers, about um, 3,500, mostly located, of course, in urban uh, centers. Um, uh, the healthcare system has been traditionally financed by a mixture of taxation, of social security uh, insurance contributions by employers and employees that together constitute about 60% um, of the financing of the system and the rest, about 35 to 40%, is actually through private resources, so it's private expenditure on healthcare, mainly out-of-pocket uh, payments. Uh, up until 2011, uh, the Greek healthcare system offered almost full population coverage via several occupation-based funds. There were about 130 social security funds operative until 2011. The system was always and still is linked to employment, and it is through the workers and time to, to healthcare that their dependence and hence the rest of the population is insured. Um, yes, and. Um, all in all, Greece has always been characterized by a quite fragmented, unequal, and privatized healthcare system. This is despite, of course, full population public coverage. Um, uh, it's been fragmented particularly because, and unequal particularly because of uh, geographical imbalances, um, with a big difference across the core and the urban centers and the periphery, uh, the rural and the islands that have uh, have always had uh, shortages when it comes to uh, primary and secondary uh, healthcare um, services. Um, it's been unequal and fragmented again because of the too many social insurance funds which were offering different benefit packages and hence different healthcare coverage to different um, uh, portions of the populations that were employment, um, employment related. And it's been quite privatized in the sense of the very high private um, healthcare expenditure, out of pocket payments that also include informal payments, um, uh, with a um, primary and ambulatory uh, care um, sector, if you will, that is more uh, private uh, than um, uh, than public, uh, without, of course, having to have uh, to wait for a very long time, for instance, for diagnostic uh, tests. And at the same time, as part of these uh, part of these paradoxes of the system, we have to put down the very high number of um, doctors, licensed doctors in Greece. Um, the one of the the highest actually in the EU, within the EU, even after ten years of, of 
austerity with about 600 and something um, doctors per 100,000 uh, of population, while the EU average is 325, while at the same time, Greece has the um, one of the smallest um, ratios of nurses per patient, as well as GPs. So there are very few nurses, very few GPs, um, uh, a huge load of, um, of uh, doctors, uh, of which, of course, a very small percentage is um, uh, forms part of the public healthcare system. And all of that, as we're going to see, the 10 years of austerity that we're going to now have a look at, should be put into the uh, social demographic changes that have been taking place in the last decades, not least a shrinking population, an aging population with, with about 20% of the population being above um, 65 years of age, and of course, a refugee and migration crisis with flows. Uh, coming from uh, conflict-torn countries in the Middle East as well as Africa for the past decades, Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, and so on. So within this uh, background, and before, sorry, we turn to care uh, austerity, in 2010, um, Greece entered into a sovereign debt crisis, and since 2010, uh, it um, has uh, been put into three economic adjustment programs uh, with uh, the triplet, the Troika, as it is known, uh, the um, ECB, the European Commission and the IMF. Um, so three uh, structural adjustment programs that led to a decade-long uh, um, austerity measures with severe um, consolidation and uh, um, across the board uh, in terms of uh, cuts in public spending uh, with uh, severe and very well documented uh, social effects uh, when it comes to increases in, uh, in inequality, unemployment, uh, poverty line, homelessness, um, social unrest, um, and so on, um, which then lead us to pretty much Today, uh, again, since 2010, there have been like six elections in Greece, the latest in July 2019, which um, uh, gave rise to a new government by the center-left um, New Democracy um, Party that has uh, tried to like kind of like turn a new page uh, for the country uh, while uh, putting forth the overall vision uh, of their platform, uh, whereby it is very clear who the engine of growth is, that's the private sector, what the role of the state is, that is to support private investment and private finance, while also, of course, alleviating particular classes that have been affected by the 10 years of austerity. Uh, and that is the government that has been leading the uh, COVID uh, response. Now, uh, when it comes to the healthcare in particular, se uh, sec sector in particular, uh, the 10 years of austerity, so from 2009, let's say, until 2018, um, what we have seen is an unprecedented uh, horizontal cuts uh, uh, in the healthcare sector, as in all other public uh, sectors that has been imposed with quick uh, cost saving as a priority. Uh, between 2009 and 2017, the healthcare budget has been slashed by about 43%. As a share of um, uh, as a share of GDP, this corresponds to a decline from 6.5% of GDP to 4.89%, uh, but we should keep in mind that uh, during that period, uh, GDP shrunk uh, cumulatively in uh, Greece by 25%. Uh, and then if one looks at disaggregated data, there's been um, cuts when it comes to medical products, they've been cut by more than 50%. Expenditure on hospital services has also been reduced by uh, 43%, uh, despite the fact that um, health worker salaries have been very low uh, in Greece relative to the rest of um, of the EU, there have been huge cuts, um, 2010, then 2012, 2017, again, there have also been reductions in number of, um, of health workers uh, in the public uh, sector, as well as in available hospital beds, and again, uh, um, there's been a reduction, uh, as a part of raising revenues, a number of public beds have also been put aside for priority use by private uh, insurers. And preventive care, which has been extremely low in Greece, has also been um, reduced uh, considerably. 
over this period. Now, besides, of course, uh, spending cuts across the board, uh, the three um, adjustment programs and uh, in Greece also uh, put forth through conditionality a series of structural reforms that have again been implemented urgently within this uh, cost saving environment. Uh, one of the biggest reform, which is actually a new one, it has been proposed many times in the past, has been the unification of the uh, social security of these 130 uh, social security funds and the establishment essentially of a unified purchaser of healthcare services and medicine that took place in 2011. Uh, with a large part also of the private sector entering into contracts with this unified purchaser to provide mainly, as we said before, primary and ambulatory um, uh, care on and paid on a fee-for-service uh, basis. There have been key changes in pharmaceutical policy um, with, uh, of course, reduction in, in um, um, medicine prices, e-prescription system, um, centralized procurement, the promotion of generic uh, medicines, uh, and the introduction of rebates and clawback mechanisms to both pharmacies, private pharmacies, and pharmaceutical companies. And as part of the rationalization of the payment of the hospitals, there's also been an uh, introduction of um, DRG hospital payment system, a disease related group uh, scheme uh, that has followed the German version. Now, it's not part of this, uh, of this talk to discuss the effectiveness of these reforms, but I would just like to point, um, to make a series of very small uh, points in the process, uh, because they will help us understand um, the state of, of, um, of the healthcare system, as well as, of course, the, the impacts that we're gonna look uh, in a bit. Uh, so the unification of insurance funds, it was mainly a cost-saving exercise. It's still based on entitlement principle. Uh, it standardized and decreased the service coverage and was based on the assumption of unemployment, and we'll see what that means in a bit. Uh, there's been huge issues with the DRG uh, payment system that I don't want to go into, into details. Um, there has been, of course, the imbalances when it comes to staff levels. Uh, and staff ratios, right, nurses, doctors, and all that, have actually been exaggerated, uh, and workloads have been increased. And when it comes to changes in the pharmaceutical uh, policy, as I said, expenditure on pharmaceuticals, uh, particular of these um, of these reforms did not come without contestations from the private sector. And as they saw their profit margins uh, going down through price reductions medicines, which led to supply chain disruptions and other exports of medicines. Uh, as an example, for example, uh, the Danish uh, company um, in 2012 um, um, actually withdrew its pen injection insulin uh, supply from Greece uh, as it found the price reduction unacceptable. Uh, for only to reintroduce it once uh, the company received a higher um, price. Um, now, when it comes to the impact of austerity, this has been very well documented. So again, I'm only going to uh, go through them um, uh, I mean, very, very briefly. But it is very important to, to, to note uh, those, and we're going to see why. Uh, there's been um, serious deterioration when it comes to uh, the availability, the accessibility, and the acceptability of public healthcare services. That has also led to the worsening of the pre-existing inequalities uh, that we talked earlier on. I mean, first and foremost, um, the unemployment-related loss of coverage, um, again, during the decade um, long of austerity, um, Unemployment in Greece uh, uh, peaked at 27.5% uh, um, uh, in 2013, but has been growing and has stayed high uh, throughout uh, the period, which since 2011, 2009 actually led to the loss of healthcare coverage for approximately 2.5 million people. That is a quarter of the Greek population that essentially was left uninsured, um, which has a huge um, has been a huge uh, barrier, of course, in access uh, to public health care. At the same time, of course, there's been an increase in the economic health of patients and an increase in unmet 
um, meet that has been one of the highest in the EU uh, still today. Um, now, the, uh, well, the quarter of the population being uninsured was a big problem that was resolved uh, only in 2016 by a law passed then to essentially cover and insure, um, the, the, to, to cover, to provide public health care um, cover to uh, the uninsured. Um, when it comes to well, uh, infectious diseases. I mean, yes, there was a comeback of infectious diseases that have uh, been um, um, that have been uh, years ago, decades ago. Like in the case of malaria, um, um, uh, Greece has been uh, malaria-free, for instance, from uh, 79, from uh, sorry, 74, which came back uh, in 2011. Uh, the same was with the Nile uh, fever. Uh, that also reappeared. Um, there was a tenfold increase in um, HIV, in newly diagnosed HIV infections uh, during the first seven months of 2011. HIV incidence actually doubled until from 2010 to 2011 until um, uh, it returned back to previous trends after infection. Uh, and there of course, huge increases to major uh, depression and to uh, suicidality along uh, stagnation when it comes to uh, maternal, infant and uh, child mortality. Uh, there is well documented evidence when it comes to the uh, relation between total healthcare spending actually and uh, mortality, all case mortality in the example um, that I have put down uh, here, whereby um, while increases in total health expenditures have always been accompanied with uh, incremental increases in total expenditure up until 2008. Between 2009 and 2014, this relationship was reversed with um, all case, with increases in all case mortality uh, spiking, uh, uh, accompanied of course with a compound decrease in uh, total health care expenditure. The right to health uh, has also been um, highly ignored. Uh, in Greece, there were no human rights assessment ever uh, within the uh, structural adjustment programs. Uh, I mean, the, the adjustment programs were negotiated and concluded with uh, very little transparency and very little if any participation uh, from the side of the people that were being affected by the measures. Um, and again, to um, another development that took place in Greece and is still very important uh, to fill in the, gap, the gaps that were opened by the 10 years of austerity since 2010, the role of voluntary initiatives and informal health care uh, networks has been um, overly, I mean, significant uh, solidarity, solidarity clinics, voluntary free clinics for medicines as well as for um, patient uh, coverage have been mushrooming around uh, Greece uh, to tackle both, of course, the refugee and migrant um, crisis and the economic ones. Okay, so this is then the setting through which we should uh, start uh, assessing the Greek success story, yes. So um, the containment up until now of the COVID-19 took place within this particular setting, within a country that has been torn with 10 years of austerity, a healthcare system that has been severely shrunk with cuts in hospitals and primary healthcare units, understaffed, under-equipped, underfunded, together of course with an increasingly impoverished population uh, with a worsening uh, health status and um, increasing unmet uh, medical needs. Uh, so then from this point of view, the quick and strict lockdown uh, that, that um, was observed uh, in Greece has been, can be and seem perhaps more like a necessity rather than, than a political option. Of course, this was not was the case in other countries, like for instance, Spain and the UK that had both suffered from austerity measures in their healthcare, healthcare systems and elsewhere in the previous decade. Um, but this is, I think, the starting point of understanding. Uh, and to then offer the link that I was discussing earlier when it comes to the capabilities of the healthcare system and of the state uh, more broadly. Besides the lockdown, which again, I'm not discussing this, but poses very has very particular implications uh, when it comes to who bears the burden of uh, social reproduction um, during 
uh, the lockdown. Yes, where the family becomes back at the center of that and within particular gender patterns, the, uh, the female uh, members of households are taking up um, a great bulk of that uh, burden on their shoulders. Uh, but beha besides the lockdown, I mean, the rest of the uh, policy responses in Greece, which I'm going to turn out, and I'm only focusing on healthcare, um, as we're going to see, are seem to have been limiting when it comes to uh, financial terms, if you will, which uh, it is reflective of both fiscal space limits, but also priorities, uh, where priorities lie when it comes to spending, as well as uh, to then, of course, this limited uh, fiscal space uh, has led to particular expansion of the healthcare capacity uh, when it comes to the hiring of staff in very uh, precarious and temporary basis, together with increases in um, ICU bed capacity and diagnostic testing, uh, those being uh, particularly done the welcoming of the private uh, sector, as we're going to see, which is another manifestation of the limited capability for uh, straight uh, for state provision, in other words, right, the retreatment of the state um, uh, is here and is seen by um, the ways through which capacity is increased uh, and how the private sector is being um, uh, brought into this, into this picture. Okay, so to contextualize now these um, policy responses, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to cover the measures that were announced in Greece last week as the uh, easing of the lockdown. So up until the beginning of May, the government has allocated about 2,000 million uh, euros to the healthcare system to address the pandemic. That was primarily for hiring of temporary staff or a topping up of salary of existing staff uh, and um, for increasing ICU beds, for buying protective equipment, uh, which has been very much lagging, as well as health materials and medicine. Uh, in terms of hiring, the government originally hired about 2,000 new doctors, nurses and paramedics. That was extended by another 2,000 uh, in the last uh, um, couple of months. Uh, this was done, of course, on a temporary duration, originally of four months, but uh, extended, however, with a little prospect for continuation of those contracts after the pandemic um, is over. And uh, these measures or these amounts, if you will, do not, of course, tackle the chronic understaffing of the public hospitals. Um, many of, of the staff, of the current staff, is actually a temporary contract um, that, according to some reports, I mean, the, la the, the vacancies the, that are in public hospitals 30,000, so hiring an extra 4,000 uh, health workers is not helping out with the system prior to the pandemic and much less so uh, in terms of responding to a COVID uh, pandemic. Um, when it comes to ICU beds, and when at the onset again of the COVID crisis, one of the smallest numbers in the EU, there was a total of 565 ICU beds increase in February 2020, which corresponds to about six uh, ICU beds per uh, 100,000 of population, with only Portugal having um, capacity of ICU at about four, and with uh, Germany having the highest ICU capacity um, per capita at around 29 point, um, point something. Um, right. So we have, we, we, I mean, Greece started from a very low capacity uh, ICU um, uh, wide, uh, and that has been, of course, expanded over uh, the course of the past um, two to three months. By the end of March, the total number of ICU beds was actually increased to 870, the majority of which came from the public. Uh, while uh, at that time 137 beds were also contracted from the private uh, hospitals, um, which then leads us to really paying attention to the uh, implications of the ways through which, through which this uh, capacity is, is brought into, uh, both when it comes to uh, in the public 
displacement of other urgent related cases, uh, as well as, of course, the, wage, the ways in which the private uh, hospitals and clinics are contracted uh, with what costs and what distributional uh, implications. Uh, there, this has been a highly contested issue in Greece. Uh, private beds have been um, contracted at a cost of 1,600 euros uh, per day and it has affinities uh, with um, similar uh, measures in the UK and the corresponding bailout, if you will, of private hospitals uh, there. Uh, and a very similar pattern is seen when it comes to testing capacity for COVID um, and reliance and financing of private diagnostic centers. So at the start of the epidemic, Greece still, I don't know if you can see it in the graph here, still has a very um, number of, of tests performed um, overall um, and the capacity was very limited from the beginning. At the onset of the epidemic the bulk of the tests were only carried out by one lab uh, in Athens and um, uh, of course this capacity was, was increased uh, in uh, made by medical schools and uh, universities uh, independently of the government uh, which whereby private labs have received um, funds from the uh, government in order to run uh, tests themselves, charging up to uh, 300 um, uh, euros per, per test. Um, Yes, uh, so this is how the policies uh, took place. The response to COVID took place within uh, the healthcare uh, system and besides, of course, the lockdown. Uh, in terms of the size, if you will, and um, as a comparative setting, which we should be very cautious uh, about data from the health uh, system response monitor, which is a platform set out by um, the European Office of the, um, of the um, WHO, um, the European Observ Observatory of um, Health uh, Policies and Systems and the um, uh, Commission. Uh, they've been created, this, uh, this platform has been created that kind of brings together all the different uh, responses of uh, policy responses of countries. Uh, and what, what we see here is that uh, as of May the 6th, uh, Greece has spent a small per capita amount uh, in healthcare of 26 uh, US dollars, uh, where Lithuania spent much, much more, as well as Estonia and Switzerland and all that. But of course, I mean, this is, but in Greece, it has been implemented by private donations kind. Nonetheless, it kind of shows an indication of the public uh, spending and uh, uh, sufficiency or not of the amount has been uh, uh, put forth, uh, together of course with uh, alarming um, attention being raised when it comes to the indirect uh, healthcare effects of COVID and how this should be addressed, particularly when it comes to the uh, postponement and cancellation of non-urgent and elective surgeries, as well as the postponing of diagnostic uh, tests uh, and what uh, means about uh, Particularly specific um, specific groups of, uh, of patients, cancer treatments, cardiovascular diseases, and infectious uh, diseases among uh, children, and what policies should be put uh, forth to make sure that we don't uh, have delayed um, delayed care with um, again uh, very negative implications. Uh, yes, the EU, right? So, but before I go to the EU. Um, uh, let me just summarize uh, the policy responses in Greece uh, along the lines of this uh, Greek um, success story. Yes. So, besides the very early and strict lockdown, there has been containing uh, the and in having very low uh, death rates. Um, the majority of the, of the reforms that, uh, of, sorry, of the, of the response, of the response policies that have taken place um, have been um, for the expansion of the capacity of the healthcare uh, system have been um, done uh, first, have had temporary nature when it comes to the hiring of, of, 
of human resources um, and have uh, relied a lot to the uh, private uh, sector without that being necessary in particular um, uh, situations as example. Uh, and um, that uh, is something that might um, have uh, both short-run and long-run uh, implications that, that need to be considered. Now, uh, with regards to the EQ, also because I think I'm running out of time, I'm going to say only a very few things. There is only one slide here. There isn't much to say. Um, the, the COVID pandemic has been a true global crisis, but once again, it has revealed um, a set of deficiencies within the, the EU. It has highlighted existing uh, divides across member states. It has highlighted existing conflicts along the national and the transnational sphere, right? Um, within within the Union, um, conflict divides when it comes to mutualization of debt, as well as it has slow response of the of the EU and the degree of decentralization and desynchronization of uh, healthcare systems within the uh, EU with still very little coordination and no common system uh, across the Union for testing, for quarantine, for locking downs and, and, and this and that. Um, it was the ECB that initially stepped up uh, and created um, an emergency pandemic plan uh, as, as a buyout for government debt to stimulate and help out. Uh, the, the the different uh, economies uh, and um, the EU and particularly the European Commission uh, after the, the the huge initial criticism uh, has been raising up the rhetoric particularly the rhetoric rather than uh, the actuality of uh, mobilization of vast uh, sums of funds uh, for the um, um, the combat of the pandemic. At the um, at the European level, uh, but those funds from billions to trillions and all that have uh, primarily been um, national level um, measures that are being undertaken by different uh, nation states, um, as well as whatever is from EU uh, money, which are still um, haven't been um, operational uh, yet. Uh, will most probably be in the form of loans rather than uh, grants, which again raises the issue of uh, redistributional um, uh, divides and disagreements, as well as um, uh, um, yes, I mean the um, refusal for uh, risk sharing and debt sharing within um, within the EU, and that is pretty much. All for me, I'm going to close only with one last bit I would like to mention, which uh, is being confirmed in Greece, and I think it might uh, be extended um, further as a post-pandemic um, issue. It seems that uh, the reconfiguration of the private-public um, nexus when it comes to this um, capacity of healthcare provision, but welfare provision more generally, is going to be tipping towards um, the private uh, sphere, particularly all sorts of different uh, public-private partnerships um, uh, are coming in to perhaps uh, stay. And this is not only for, for welfare, I think it's also been it comes to climate change combat with green finance and all that. Um, and hence, we kind of see the limited uh, state uh, capacity to respond to crisis and to uh, take up uh, the space in the provision of social and uh, welfare policies. And that would be all from me. Uh, and then there's just a set of references for whoever is interested uh, in some of the, of the main uh, papers. Um, uh, that have been covering this debate. Uh, yeah, so we, um, if everyone could put their questions into the chat box, we'll get to them. But while um, people are thinking of some, um, I guess I'll get the ball rolling. Um, you talked about how there is now a unified purchase of healthcare and unification of insurance funds. But the, the actual system itself is quite fragmented, like geographically and public and private. But what we've seen in this country, is, at least, is there's been shortages of things that are now needed much more than they were a few months ago, such as ventilators and 
equipment. Um, and this country has had trouble sourcing those and um, um, providing them to the healthcare system that it's supposedly in charge of as a whole. Is there much trouble in Greece when the unification is about purchasing of healthcare rather than about this system itself? Um, uh, yes. Um, I think on, on that front, there are similarities between the UK and, and um, the Greek system, despite the fact that the UK one is much more privatized than the, than the Greek one. The difference between being the sole purchaser of um, healthcare services from both the public and the private sphere and being the sole provider of those services, yes. Um, Again, I mean, of course, these are all historically and country-specific uh, uh, processes that we need to be looking into. But in principle, uh, let's say, um, the degree of, um, of maneuver, the, 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 the capacity for maneuver, the capacity to mobilize resources, yes, physical, but also um, um, a human, uh, I don't know, to deal with an emergency, let's say, has to very much uh, to do with um, uh, the interaction, right, of uh, different actors, okay, that themselves may belong in the public, in the private sphere, but also in the in the third sector, okay, in the volunteer sector, let's say, the interactions of the different agents in the whole um, chain of provision from production until until the end. Yes. Uh, so essentially issues that have to do with ownership, who owns uh, the production, issues that has to do with accountability, who controls the provision, uh, issues that has to do with well, how are these financed, right? Who is financing these things are part and parcel of how you can mobilize um, a very complex system, let's say, to respond to a particular, um, to a particular need. And I don't know if I'm answering your question. Uh, but these kind of shortages, okay, geographically as well, have been um, observed pretty much everywhere. But then the question is to choose the mechanism through which the reason mechanism through which these shortages can be sorted. Um, they can be quickly tackled, sorted, and with what distributional implications always, right? Um, because one thing is to expand capacity through the use of private hospitals, but then we should always scrutinize at what cost that is, and what does that mean for the public provision as well, okay? Uh, and the same applies, of course, to PPE, to, um, to protective equipment, to ventilators, to uh, all sorts of different medical equipment that are necessary, okay, uh, in, in dealing with different um, healthcare emergencies. Um, yeah, so we've got a question from Karen who asks, um, why is the death rate so much lower in Greece than the UK, given both countries have suffered badly under austerity? Um, have the Greek public been better at self-isolation or are there other factors at play as well? Um, yeah, um, no, the Greek public is not better at self-isolation. Um, the, the fundamental difference in Greece and UK has been uh, the fact that uh, the Greek lockdown happen, happened much, much earlier than the one. Uh, and um, it was much stricter. It was not self-imposed. Yes. Uh, there were strict uh, regulation rules of when to go out. Uh, you had to fill in particular forms when you were going out and they were strict police monitoring of uh, those people outside. Um, but so it was strict, so it was imposed uh, and it took place much before, much before relative to the UK. So Greek lockdown started, I mean slowly, right, started um, with a cancellation of some big events before even a first death was, uh, was um, uh, recorded in Greece, yes. And then schools were locked down on the 12th of March after only a few deaths have been reported in Greece, yes. Uh, 
Uh, so essentially the lockdown, which really slowed down the, the, the spreading, happened at a time where the severely understaffed and under-equipped hospitals uh, were um, never reached their capacity limits, which is something that, for instance, uh, happened in, in, in Italy, in Spain, and in, in the UK as well. So the difference is, it has to do with the timing of the lockdown, rather than whether the individuals can stay more in than some individuals can stay in more than others. Um, it was the timing and the fact that it was monitored uh, strictly. Um, yes. We've got another question from who says, thanks for the informative talk. Um, I wonder whether, apart from the rebalancing in favour of the private sector, uh, the pandemic is opening up space for discussion on the possibilities of reversing austerity, particularly in the healthcare sector. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer. Uh, I, know. I mean, I would hope so. I would really like that to happen. But I don't know if this is uh, where we're going. I mean, to uh, open discussion for uh, reversing of austerity, to open a discussion Uh, is a, is something that entails, I mean, very um, very drastic changes in the organization of um, in the organization of of of, um, of social provision in general, social and, and care provision. Um, and I don't know if this is where we're going. Okay. Um, to me, it seems that this is not where we're going. Okay, I mean, I don't know. At the beginning of the of the COVID pandemic, I was actually uh, a bit more optimistic of viewing this as an opportunity to reconsider um, the reorganization of, um, of production, social uh, reproduction, as well as uh, production and social organization. But I don't know. Uh, uh, this is uh, where we're going, and it actually needs lots of mobilization from from the bottom rather than the top, because what you see within the EU in particular is a very, um, it's a very nation-based response as opposed to a union-based response. And you also see it at the global level. Uh, it's a very nation-state response as opposed to a global response, uh, even for the most, uh, the poorest countries in the world that didn't have all sorts of different negotiations to see if you will be able to, uh, pose the payments or the repayments of debt, you know, for a few months to help them out. So I really don't know if, um, I, I mean, I, I would hope for it, but I don't know if there is um, scope for reconfiguring uh, the, um, yeah, the positions of the different actors in the in the chain of provision. I really don't know. Yeah. Um, next, we have a question from. Um, Anna, uh, who asks, what is the current fiscal space for Greece and how does it differ from other EU countries um, due to the conditions imposed by the Troika? Um, okay, um, these are, at, at the moment, these are untapped waters, so I really don't know at the moment. The reason being is that um, the EU has scrapped the has, has used the um, exception clause uh, and has allowed states to um, not uh, follow up with the three percent of uh, deficit uh, limit, three percent of GDP. This has been scrapped because of exceptional um, uh, circumstances. Uh, in the case of Greece, for example, what has been um, uh, um, uh, abandoned by with EU, of course, uh, support has been. We no longer have the 3.5 surplus target. This has been gone, and we are allowed to have deficits uh, and all that. Uh, and again, 
despite the original uh, missteps of, of the EU, they, they've also been stepping up and discussing about um, much faster state aid uh, policies and hence, you know, the allowance of, of, of countries to accumulate um, deficits. Now, what does that mean uh, for the fiscal space for Greece in particular and in relation to other countries? Um, I don't know at this point. I mean, at this point, it is clear that everyone is accumulating deficits. Yes, not only because of the big measures that are being taken outside the healthcare system as well. Again, predominantly when it comes to the nationalization of private wage bills that has never happened before. Yes, the covering of uh, the private sector wages during lockdowns and extended lockdowns. Okay, um, so. Uh, there seems to have, miraculously, <laughs> yeah, countries seems to have found fiscal space that they never had before, they would have never considered, I mean, to, um, uh, this is an income replacement okay, um, due to lockdown, yes. Uh, but we still don't know how this is going to play out, uh, I mean, the, the, future, uh, the future forecasts are like, yeah, really bad, okay, we're talking about a huge global recession, much bigger than the 2007-2008. Uh, and I don't know what that would imply in terms of, you know, fiscal limits, in terms of debt accumulation, in terms of uh, debt crisis in the months to come. Okay. Uh, this is still to be, to, be, to be seen. There is radical uncertainty. Um, so to follow on from um, exactly that, Mark is asking a question about the unprecedented spending. Um, he, mm -hmm. he asks, um, with the unprecedented spending among European nations, it follows that there is a risk of a bound in inflation. inflation. Uh, in the past, this is usually, the usual response has been higher interest rates. However, that would make current government debts more dangerous. Do you think an inflation jump is likely? And he which you've already sort of answered, he asked, do you think there's a chance of debt crises? But he specifically um, talks here about um, Argentina and countries like that are at critical levels. So I guess, is there a chance? What's the difference between, say, the global north and the global south in the uh, debt crisis? Kind of what he's getting at, I suppose. Very difficult questions, huh? Um Okay, inflation. When it comes to inflation, uh, I personally don't think there's an issue with inflation. Uh, to the contrary, I think there is a problem with deflation, uh, despite all the borrowing and the spending, because the COVID crisis is also unprecedented in the sense that it is not a supply shock. Okay, it's not only a demand shock, meaning um, depressed consumption and depressed demand at the national and the global level because of lock, lock, lack of um, loss of income. Uh, but there is also, it's also a supply um, shock because we are here talking about a disruption of the production process big time. So we're not producing and prices are going down. We're not consuming and prices are going down. So any kind of boosting that is going to come through um, debt borrowing through the public sphere. I don't think inflation will be the first um, element of concern uh, for anyone. And I don't think that inflation, if anything, uh, the, the current are for inflation to be competitive. Um, yeah, we just have different issues, okay. Um, now, when it comes to debt crisis, uh, global south and global um, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. Uh, my my okay. My view on the matter is as follows. Okay, there is there there isn't a uh, framework for sovereign debt crisis resolution. There's never been one. Yes. Um, which countries' debt become unsustainable and in um, Despite, of course, the IMS scientific measurement processes, right, the sustainability analysis and all that, is to some uh, great extent not only the outcome of a um, projection exercise, but it is also the outcome of particular uh, political configurations, particular um, power uh, structures, uh, 
within yes, uh, the global <laughs> sphere, if you will. Uh, there will be that crisis, that is for sure, right? I mean, again, revenues, public revenues are shrinking, okay, because production has been disrupted. Yes, the supply chain has been disrupted. Uh, and people are not getting paid because they're not working because they are in lockdown. And it's not only in Greece, I'm saying in all sorts of different countries throughout. Uh, so revenues have been going down, and at the same time, yes, uh, public spending has been has been um, increasing. Uh, so th there will be increasing increase in deficits and most probably increase in debts as well. Okay, uh, there will be a crisis, uh, debt crisis, and the question is, because it is of a global nature, is to then see how this can be uh, resolved. Yes, at the global level, if you will, what will happen if you have a few countries with with um, with debt problems as opposed to only one here and one there. Yes, I don't know. I hope I'm answering uh, these uh, questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's um, all we've got time for. Would you like to say anything to sum up or to conclude? Uh, no, I mean, I think we kind of like covered up pretty much everything. Uh, I would just like to say uh, once again, thank you so much uh, to the OEF and to our uh, students for organizing this uh, this series and for inviting me. And thanks so much for all the participants that um, uh, have been uh, that joined us in this uh, in this uh, seminar. Um, awesome. Um, I'd just like to say before we go, the next webinar is uh, tomorrow at 3 o'clock time and it's on corporations and COVID bailout saviors with Carolina Alves from the University of Cambridge and Farwar Seal from the University of Manchester. And again, check out our social media uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you all. Thank you.